Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. The Martian Chronicles. By Ray Bradbury. In 1946, Ray Bradbury published The Martian Chronicles, a collection of short stories. Episode-style narratives depict a bleak Mars exploration future. The captain of the first mission is assassinated by a Martian before he can establish communication. Then, the second mission is seen as a hallucination. A third expedition encounters Martians who are adept at deceiving the explorers through telepathy and the capacity to take on multiple identities. The fourth mission, on the other hand, discovers that the Earthlings have spread a disease of chickenpox that has nearly wiped out the whole population. In the meantime, as a nuclear war looms on Earth, hordes of humanity are making their way to Mars. Mars will be habitable in the near future. Even a hot dog stand is built by humans on Earth. Eventually, Mars begins to resemble the Earth that they left behind. Then Earth goes to war with the United States of America, and the inhabitants of Mars observe the ensuing conflagration. It's time for everyone to leave Mars and get back to Earth. Some people stay behind. Only a few people have chosen to remain on Mars, and they are feeling increasingly alone. Earth's wars are heating up. When the planet is damaged, it swiftly becomes uninhabitable. Small groups of people will return to Mars in the near future. This time, they had no way to depart the planet after they destroyed their rockets. A mother, father, and three boys lead the way out of the country. The new Martians are here. Soon another family with daughters will join them. January 1999, Rocket Summer. The launch takes place in Ohio in January. The rocket's heat transforms the globe into a tropical paradise. It's a rocket summer. The word spread like wildfire across the open air dwellings. February 1999, Ela. The planet Mars is located 54 million miles away from our own world. There were wine trees all around Mr. and Mrs. K's mansion, which had crystal pillars and was located near a fossil sea. While reading a metal book with elevated hieroglyphs, Mr. K heard a gentle voice speak to him from the book. There was something wrong as Mrs. K was harvesting golden fruit from the wine trees. She had a dream about a tall man as she went inside to rest in her favorite chair, which moved to fit her perfectly. Six feet one inch was a colossal size for him. The man's eyes were blue and his hair was black. When she informed her husband about the dream, he felt it was a hoax. When she told him that the man who fell from the sky was named Nathaniel York, he was shocked and horrified. She had a dream in which a man spoke to her. He said he and his companion, Bert, were from the planet Earth. In response to Mrs. K's inquiry about the possibility of life on the third planet, her husband shot down the notion, declaring, the third planet is incapable of producing life. In her sleep, she reflects on the rocket. She's belting out tunes. In the dream, York kissed her and promised to bring her back to Earth with him. Her husband wakes her and she tells him about the kiss and the promise. Even though she assures her spouse that it was simply a foolish dream, he feels envious of her. Despite her best efforts, he learns that the ship will arrive in Green Valley from her. As Ela tells her husband, Mr. K, about her plans to meet her friend the following day, he conjures up a family friend's visit and asks her to vow to stay at home. Mr. K, Ool, says he's had enough of waiting for their guest to arrive by the time the sun sets. He removes his bee-infested gun from the closet and tells his wife he's going out to hunt. He gets her to vow that she would stay in the house. She then feels a huge warmth as if a great fire were passing through the air. Whirlwind of noise. Metal glints in the sky. To get to the green valley, Ela begins to run, only to halt and brand herself a naive lady. She hears a few gunshots coming from Green Valley's direction. After hearing footsteps on the driveway, Ela is disappointed to learn that it is her spouse. They were supposed to see their pal the next day, and he says he remembered. She inquires as to whether he had fired a shot, but he denies it. After dinner, she agrees with him that she will feel better the next day. August 1999, The Summer Night. In the middle of a performance on Mars, a woman starts singing. She, on the other hand, finds herself singing a music from the planet Earth. She walks in beauty by Lord Byron is the source of these lines. She covers her mouth with her hands as though she's about to burst out laughing. The question on everyone's mind is, what are those words? This sounds like a song. What's the name of that dialect? Everyone was whistling foreign tunes as they walked down dark streets, singing songs from their childhood. Women screamed in a thousand villas as they awoke in their sleep. When you wake up tomorrow, something dreadful will have happened. There is only the sound of the night watchman singing a strange melody as Mars cities fall into a deep slumber. August 1999, The Earthmen. In the early hours of the morning, 
Captain Williams and his crew arrive on the surface of the Red Planet. To their surprise, a woman who speaks English answers the door. He claims they're from the planet Earth. To his surprise, she names him a Martian and says they are on Tyr, the planet they are on. Captain Williams soon realizes that the woman is not conversing verbally, but rather through telepathy, rather than the more common means of speech. She then adds, good day, before slamming the door in his face and walking away. He knocks on the door again in an attempt to convince her of the urgency of their meeting, but to no avail. However, she continues to chastise him, saying that he presumably wants to talk to her husband, but he can't because he's already occupied. He grows more adamant as she becomes more rude and refuses to speak to him. As a last resort, she leaves the astronauts in the kitchen to wait for her husband. The guy and woman upstairs are arguing, and then it goes quiet. Following a one-hour lull in communication, the humans set out in search of their hostess. It turns out that she'd completely forgotten about them and is now busy watering flowers somewhere else. She offers them a message to deliver to her next-door neighbor, Mr. Triple-A, who will be pleased to receive it. According to her, he's the one they'd like to see in any case. He'll tell them everything they ask for. As soon as they arrive, Mr. Triple-A is furious that his neighbor sent them to him, as if his labor was of lesser importance. He complains about his neighbor's rudeness and considers challenging him to a duel as the Earthmen try to persuade him of the marvel of their arrival. It's not his job to take care of them, Mr. Triple-A tells them before he goes. Captain Williams and his crew of three are fatigued at this point. Eventually, they meet a child in town who can direct them to Mr. Rive's whereabouts. The astronauts do not awe the young girl either. Mr. Rive inquires as to what they desire. The captain says they'd like a pat on the back for making it that far in a rocket ship. They are both exhausted and hungry, he explains. At the very least, they'd like somewhere to sleep. Mr. Ive wants them to sign a document. Mr. Ive begins to giggle as the captain asks if his troops should sign as well. When the captain asks about euthanasia, he brings it up in passing while going over the papers. They get a key from Mr. Ive. Not the city's key, but a key to a room where they can sleep. In the morning, Mr. Triple X will be there, he informs them. The captain begs Mr. I for a small token of appreciation for their hard work. Congratulation. He mockingly patted his hand. The four men make their way into the room, one at a time. There's a large gang of Martians waiting for them when they get there. Mr. U is there to welcome them. The audience erupts in applause when they make their entrance. Clapping and shouting encouragement. Astonishingly, when Mr. U asks the astronauts to relate their stories, the audience goes wild. To their annoyance, the other patients reveal that some of them are from Earth and others from Jupiter or Saturn. So why didn't anyone respond? This sounds like a classic case of psychosis to me. As Captain Williams and his comrades notice their fellow captives performing magical acts while they watch. The captain, on the other hand, explains that the magic is nothing more than hallucinatory. They may spread the hallucinations between one another because they all interact telepathically. Despite Captain Williams' best efforts, Mr. Triple X still refuses to believe that they are not nuts. The captain, Mr. Triple X tells him, is insane, and the three other guys are secondary hallucinations he sees. In an attempt to show Mr. Triple X that he and his crew are real, Captain Williams takes him to the rocket. That doesn't sound like Mr. Triple X, however. Then Mr. Triple X takes out a gun and kills the captain. His jaw drops as he sees the other three men still standing. Mr. Triple X is blown away by the intensity of your delusions. They are all then killed by him. When they don't go away, Mr. Triple X kills himself because he believes he's going nuts. At dusk, locals search for the rocket, which is then taken to a salvage yard where it is scrapped. March 2000, The Taxpayer. Hence, Mr. Pritchard thought he had the right to join the crew of the rocket ship that was en route to Mars. He desires to leave this planet. In two years, he predicts there will be an atomic war. They make several attempts to persuade the man that going to Mars would be harmful. Both of the previous trips ended in failure. Perhaps they were so content that they didn't want to return to Earth, he claims. The taxpayer saw the rocket go off without him as the police drove him away in a van. April 2000, the third expedition. Sixteen astronauts have made it to Mars' surface after a harrowing journey. The rocket was landed on the lawn of a Victorian house by Captain John Black. They notice geraniums on the porch and a music stand titled Beautiful Ohio through the front window. Brick and white houses are all they see. In the distance, you can see a church spire. After discovering that the air is breathable but thin, 
Even though they had assumed Captain York and his crew perished the day he arrived on Mars and Captain Williams and his crew perished two days after their arrival, the astronauts discovered that the men from the first and second expeditions may still be alive and aiding the Martians. Since they've landed on the other side of the planet, Captain Black disagrees. The thought of leaving the ship is still causing him trepidation. When he inquires about the men's ages, they all say they were born in the 1950s. After all, he tells them, he is old enough to be their father now. Just 80 years old, I suppose. Here I am, on Mars, not any more exhausted than the rest of you, but immensely more skeptical, having been born in Illinois in 1920 by the grace of God and a technology that has recently discovered how to make some old men young again. He instructs them to broadcast their arrival to Earth through radio, and to convey additional information the next day. Afterwards, he formulates a rough itinerary for a short outing. With him and two others, he'll look around while everyone else remains on the ship. No one is sure if space flight began on Mars at the same time as it did on Earth, or if it began much earlier and was kept secret. They soon begin to believe that a previous group of Earthlings arrived on Mars and established an Earth village in order to alleviate their homesickness. One of the males suddenly stops running and exclaims, Grandma! Grandpa! With joy! The elderly couple is overjoyed to see their grandson and extends a warm welcome to the other men who have arrived at their home. If you ask the grandmother how long they've been in town, she says, ever since we died. This isn't heaven, they said when asked if it was. They go on to say that they were dropped into Earth from a world very much like ours. Captain Black can make out the murmurs of a crowd. They witness their crew getting out of their rocket and waving to onlookers as they investigate. While a brass band performs, they are seeing dead relatives and friends. Disobedience to the captain's orders will result in court-martial. And then there is the captain, who sees his brother for the first time. After a quick dash to the captain's house, he discovers his parents there, waiting for them. Captain Black and his brother retire to their room after spending the afternoon with their deceased relatives. Captain asks about Marilyn and is promised he will see her the next day, as he drifts off. Captain Black begins to question whether or not this is all a dream as he lies in bed contemplating. When he hears his brother stir in his sleep, he rushes to fetch his men. No one ever saw the captain reach the door. Sixteen coffins were removed from the houses on the next day, as well. Coffins were taken to the churchyard, the mayor delivered a speech, and a band performed a somber dirge. The faces of Captain Black's family members, as well as his grandparents, began to change back to their original Martian appearances as a result. Sixteen excellent men died unexpectedly and suddenly in the middle of the night. Everyone went back to town and had a day off after that. June 2001, and the moon be still as bright. Because of an earlier expedition's chicken pox infection, the whole Martian population died one year later, when the fourth expedition arrived. Spender, the crew's archaeologist, is exempt from Captain Wilder's celebration policy. Disgusted by their lack of respect, he retaliates. That leaves the other members of the group to go exploring on their own. His return is met with additional resistance from his crew, who are suspicious of his claims of being a Martian. When Spender is possessed, he goes on a killing spree, murdering five of his co-workers. Spender flees to the hills when he feels bad. To which Wilder responds, Why did you do this? Spender claims he wants to prevent the settlement of humans on Mars. Wilder shoots him when he refuses to back down. Because he feels bad about shooting him, Wilder decides to step up and guard Mars on his own. His teeth are knocked out by a crewman who uses the Marian ruins as target practice. August 2001, The Settlers. Humans begin to settle on Mars in search of work. Though initially isolated, the population of early colonists begins to rise. The Green Morning, December 2001. On Mars, Benjamin Driscoll has a plan to increase the amount of oxygen. He's a seed planter on a motorcycle. When he glances back, he sees the beginnings of green vegetation. He almost passed out from shock at how quickly they were expanding. There were 5,000 new trees in the yellow sun when he came out of a deep sleep. February 2002, The Locusts. A slew of new settlements grow up all over Mars as the planet's population continues to soar. They resemble miniature American cities. August 2002, Night Meeting. It is Thomas Gomez's first stop on the route to the highlands. I love Mars because things are continually changing says the old man when asked if he liked the red planet. Next, he enters a diner and encounters a praying mantis that is as large as he is. They understand that they can't touch each other as they chat about it. While the Martian claims he's going to a huge event in town,
Gomez notices that it's completely abandoned. Both men, Thomas and the Martian, believe it was all a dream to begin with. October 2002, The Shore. The males had arrived on Mars first, followed by the ladies. A large number of newcomers began to arrive quickly. They begin the process of building houses. They come from cities, and all of them are from America. February 2003, Interim. To build their homes, the Americans transported lumber from Oregon, and in the new churches, they sung hymns. It seemed as though a small Iowa town had been transported to another planet. April 2003, The Musicians. Desecrated Martian corpses are found by the children as they roam over the ruinous terrain. Despite the consequences, the children continue to engage in this behavior since they were aware that the game would end soon due to the speed at which the firemen were removing the dead bodies. June 2003, way in the middle of the air. This part has returned to Earth. Large numbers of African Americans in the deep south of the United States are constructing their own spacecraft with the goal of relocating to Mars. One of the white males tries to stop them because he claims that the man owes him $50 in back money. In return, the other settlers pay him back and he joins them. Anger boils over on Tisa's face. He is no longer able to bully the black population. He notices some abandoned parcels as he drives away. He gets into an accident while trying to run over the packages. 2004-05, The Naming of Names. People from the first few voyages to Mars have given their towns their names on Mars. After that, Earth's aristocracy pours in. People's life were mapped out and laws and regulations were established. April 2005, Usher 2. Edgar Allan Poe's tales are brought to life on Mars in this tale. Stendhal reenacts Edgar Allan Poe's House of Usher to avenge the moral climate, a government agency that has made fantasy stories illegal. As a way to bring to life the stories of horror, he has built robots and mechanical bats, apes, and vampires. A robotic monkey assassinates Garrett, who had come to look into the matter. Afterwards, Stendhal summons more politicians who are responsible for the censorship and kills them in inventive ways based on previous stories. Robots are used to replace people who die in Stendhal's system. In the end, the genuine Garrett, the other was a robot, appears, and Stendhal imprisons him like in the cask of Amontillado. A bog slowly swallows Stendhal's home as he flees in a helicopter like in the fall of the House of Usher. August 2005, The Old Ones. The last group to immigrate to Mars are the retirees. September 2005, The Martian. On Mars, Lafarge and his wife Anna have taken up residence. Until he shows up on their doorstep, their son Tom, who is dead, they have settled in, but they are missing him. In spite of Lafarge's reservations about the identity of the man, Anna has no intention of letting him go back to town without her. Their Tom, a Martian, transforms into the lost girl of another couple and he keeps doing so until he meets the needs of everyone he comes into contact with. The Martian flees when a police officer mistakenly believes he's a criminal. While his visage continues to morph, he finally falls to the ground and dies. It's time for the Lafarge to return to their gloomy home lives. November 2005, The Luggage Store. Priest and baggage salesmen discuss the dangers of nuclear war. When the war begins, the luggage salesman expects a huge demand for his products because so many people will want to return home. The father purchases a new valise as they gaze at the night sky. November 2005, the off-season. One of Captain Wilder and Spender's crew members has launched a hot dog stand on Mars, Sam Park Hill. He's ecstatic about it and anticipates a flurry of orders. Whenever his wife, Alma, asks him about his former captain, Sam responds that he was promoted and is currently on a long-haul flight to Jupiter and Pluto. Sam's wife is pessimistic about all the business he plans to do. An alien approaches Sam, who warns the Martian to leave or Sam will infect him with the disease. One of the rare survivors is the Martian, according to the Martian. Sam shoots the Martian because he refuses to listen to him. Sam flees aboard a stolen sand ship after his wife spots a Martian invasion fleet. He's finally been apprehended by the Martians but all they want to do is deliver him a message. They say tonight is the day. 100,000 miles of land are given to him. They then instruct him to prepare an abundance of hot dogs. As Sam begins to get everything ready for the impending influx of newcomers, he notices the earth is on fire. While telling him to be ready for customers, his wife is being skeptical. In roughly a million years, there should be a lot more of them. There appears to be a break in the schedule. November 2005, The Watchers. People on Mars are watching the Earth burn from afar. The fire was extinguished around midnight. 
people began to be concerned about the well-being of those they left behind on Earth. Morse code was soon used to transmit communications. The continent of Australia was obliterated by a nuclear stockpile that went off too soon. London and Los Angeles bombed. War. Return to your place of residence. Please return. Please return. Return to your place of residence. In the early hours, the bag salesman was making a good profit. December 2005, The Silent Towns. There were no people in the town or in the residences. Only one person remained on Mars, which was nearly deserted. Walter Grip is a recluse who lives alone in the mountains. He enjoys himself amid the town's silence, although he is solitary. He hears the phone ring one day, but he's too far away to pick it up in time to answer it. To figure out who was calling, he decided to call each and every number in the phone book. Finally, Walter makes it to New Texas City's largest beauty shop to see Genevieve Seltzer. However, the connection is lost. The fastest car Walter can get takes him to her, but she's already gone. Upon his return, he discovers her waiting for him in the streets of his hometown. It turns out Walter doesn't like the last lady on Mars. Overweight, possessive, and aggressive, she's not someone you'd want to be around. Walter bolts for the hills as soon as she removes her wedding gown. When the phone rings, he never picks it up. April 2026, The Long Years. Hathaway, a member of the fourth expedition, and his wife and three children live on Mars in this novel. A graveyard with four gravestones is where he goes every day to say apologize, yet he was lonely. He sees a rocket one day. The old Captain Wilder shows up again for one more visit. Pluto and Jupiter are back in the hands of the explorer. He's on the prowl for surviving souls. In the end, Grip refused to leave. Upon seeing him, Hathaway extends an invitation to him and his crew to dine with his family. When Wilder learns how young Hathaway's family is, he becomes intrigued. Hathaway's family was discovered by one of his soldiers. He has a robot family now. Hathaway succumbs to a heart attack and is pronounced dead at the scene. After saying goodbye to the robots, Wilder departs. August 2026, there will come soft rains. In Allendale, California, a suburban home, a voice may be heard coming from the wall. It serves as a wake-up call in announcing of the day's major announcements to an empty house. Birthdays, anniversaries, and bills are all reasons to remember. Sprinklers are turned on to water the grass as the kitchen prepares breakfast. Outside walls are also washed with the family's shadows, which are etched into them by the blast. A dog is found dead in the house after wandering and covered in wounds. In the blink of an eye, the mess is cleaned up by little robot mice. The lady of the home's favorite poetry, There Will Be Soft Trains, is recited by the house that night. Poems claim that even if man is wiped out by conflict, nature will continue to rebuild without a care. A tree falls on the house in the middle of the night, starting a fire. Despite the house's best efforts, all that remained in the morning was a single wall that repeatedly stated the date. October 2026, The Million Year Picnic. Arriving to Mars, a family has brought enough food and supplies to endure for several months. Parents and three boys' dad ruins their rocket to demonstrate that they will now be living on Mars. He tells that the next day, another family would arrive. In this case, the father allows his sons to select the city where they would eventually settle. To which they respond, Yes, sir, I'd want to see Martians. When they arrive at the canal, they are instructed to gaze in the mirror. Mrs. Ela K., an unhappily married Martian housewife who, without realizing it, is anticipating the arrival of Captain York from Earth. Mr. Rul K., he is envious of the Earthling his wife is wishing for. As a result of his overbearing behavior, his wife feels under his control at all times. When his rocket lands, he kills Captain York with a single shot. Nathaniel York, captain of the first expedition. Captain Williams, the leader of the second mission, he is a more cautious individual. He and his three companions have been committed to a mental institution. To show their disillusional natures, they are then executed by a Martian schizophrenic. Captain John Black, the captain of the third expedition. The Martians deceive him and his crew into believing they are their long-dead relatives who have been raised from the dead on Mars. The team is assassinated while their guards are distracted. Captain Wilder, the captain of the fourth expedition. When they get on Mars, they discover that the Martians have been decimated by a scourge of chicken pox brought by previous explorers. To be respectful of the deceased while also allowing his men to unwind after a long travel, Wilder makes an effort to do both. After killing one of his crew members, Jeff Spender, for going native and killing other crew members for demonstrating contempt, 
he is enraged by the maltreatment of the relics. Wilder is promoted and sent to Jupiter and Pluto after his appearance on the show. Jeff Spender, an archaeologist with the fourth expedition. He is awestruck by Mars and sets off on his own to explore it. As soon as he returns to their camp, he claims to be a Martian and tries to persuade the rest of the crew to follow suit. Then he chooses to slaughter the crew in order to save Mars. Runs into the hills after he kills four of the men. Captain Wilder pursues him and shoots him after a lengthy talk about the futility of safeguarding Mars from the government and corporations. Sam Park Hill, a member of the fourth expedition. A tyrant and a violent person, he is a bully. While exploring the Martian ruin, he was scolded for shooting out windows. He leaves the service and runs a hot dog business as other settlers come, including his wife. However, Mars initiates evacuation before he can sell a one hot dog. Hathaway, also a member of the fourth expedition. He holds dual degrees in medicine and geology. As soon as Mars is evacuated, he and his family will stay behind. A long time later, Captain Wilder comes to retrieve Hathaway, only to find that his family had perished and that he had built robot duplicates of them all those years previously. He is suffocated to death before help arrives. Without him, his mechanical family continues. Benjamin Triscoll, has trouble with the oxygen on Mars and plants trees to clean up the air. William Stendhal, he built an automated house in honor of Edgar Allan Poe, Hawthorne, Lovecraft, and Lewis Carroll's fantastical writings. He intends to exact vengeance on the authors who were previously barred from publishing. In order to kill the moral climate's investigators, he carries out the procedures detailed in the classic horror stories. Walter Grip, misses the evacuation and discovers that he is the sole survivor of the Martian colonization effort. He can't wait to get away from the last lady on Mars when he finally finds her. He takes off running for cover. Biography of Ray Bradbury Ray Douglas Bradbury who was born on August 22, 1920, in Waukegan, Illinois, fell in love with storytelling at a young age. At 14, his family went to Los Angeles, California and his future was set in motion. He was enamored with Hollywood and spent many afternoons attempting to meet stars in the industry. When he was 14, he was hired as a writer for an episode of Burns and Allen. When he was 11, he began penning his first stories. The only type of paper he used was butcher paper because that was the only paper he could find. Throughout his life, Bradbury wrote every day since he could wield a pen. As much time as he could, he spent at the library, and he gave back to the libraries in return. I grew up surrounded by books. To be honest, I have no faith in college or university. Because most students lack financial resources, I believe in libraries. It was during the Great Depression that I graduated from high school, and my family had no money. For 10 years, I went to the library three times a week because I couldn't go to college. Following that, he went on in an interview with the Paris Review, saying, college is not the place to learn how to write. Because of the teacher's presumption that they know more than you do, it's a terrible environment for writers. Bradbury was a lifelong bookworm and a staunch advocate for public libraries. In California, he was involved in a number of efforts to generate money and prevent libraries from closing. Even though he was a big fan of computers, he was opposed to the idea of his books being converted to electronic form. The publisher of Fahrenheit 451 finally agreed to make it freely available to libraries, and he finally consented. The publisher continues to make it available to libraries free of charge in ebook format as the publisher's exclusive offering to libraries. Edgar Allan Poe had a major influence on Bradbury's early horror stories, which he penned until he was 18. As a 12 year old, he penned a sequel to Edgar Rice Burroughs' novel, The War Lord of Mars, based on his admiration for the author. He was also a talented illustrator who created his own Tarzan comics. Citing Jules Verne and Henry George Wells as his two favorite science fiction authors, he stated, he believes the human being is in a strange situation in a very odd universe, and he believes we may triumph by behaving decently. Bradbury married Marguerite McClure, also known as Maggie, in 1947 and the couple was together until her death in 2003. Four girls were born to them. He didn't have a driver's license and relied on public transportation or his bicycle to get around. He was still living at home when he got married at the age of 27. He was friends with a wide range of people, including writers, filmmakers, actors, and more. After Gene Roddenberry invited him to write for Star Trek, they became close friends for 30 years. They stayed buddies even after he declined his advances. In addition, he had a close relationship with the man responsible for creating the Adams family. 
authoring several short stories based on the TV show's plot. He had a stroke in 1999 and was confined to a wheelchair for the remainder of his life. Despite this, he continued to write. For The New Yorker, he penned an essay. His inspiration for writing was the subject of the book, which was published just a week before he died. When Ray Bradbury passed away in 2012, he was 91 years old. Many people, including President Obama, paid tribute to him in writing. According to Stephen King's website, it's hard to overestimate Ray Bradbury's accomplishments, as he penned more than 300 stories and three novels. A Sound of Thunder was the name of one of the latter. The receding thunder of a giant's footsteps is the sound I'm hearing right now. In spite of this, the novels and stories remain, with all of their resonance and odd beauty, intact. Fahrenheit 451 is the name he requested to be printed on his tombstone. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video. Music